doing our uh, live stream today, but reason being was that I just, actually, you know what, I don't want to get into that. I just had some altercation with some guy trying to convince me that we have to have Adab with uh, his leader, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, or I should say Mirza Ghulam Qadiani. But we're not even going to get into that. But when it comes to manners and adab, <clears throat> you don't have manners and adab with people who are openly insulting the Prophet, peace be upon him, or indirectly insulting the Prophet, peace be upon him. The last time someone called himself a prophet in the presence of the Messenger, peace be upon him, was Musaylama al Kadhab. And Musaylama al Kadhab, we know what the Prophet himself called him. The Messenger himself called him the liar. All right, Musaylama the liar. So knowing that this group of people out there, the uh, Qadianis, are out there and they're trying to <clears throat> make themselves into a legitimate accepted religion or accepted madhab inside of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we should have, I guess, uh, we should have some policy towards them and understanding of, of, of what our position is regarding these folks. Uh, namely that our position is that there are certain things that are broad, major lines, and ayat that are muhkamat. There are certain ayat that are called muhkam, meaning there's no discussion in them. The ayat is muhkam. There's no discussion. There is no uh, room for discussion. There is no acceptable difference of opinion regarding the muhkamat. Ayat muhkamat. Hunna umul kitab. Wa ukharu mutashabihat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us some ayat are the foundations of the book. Can you have a doubt in your foundation? Can you have a difference of opinion? Imagine someone's building a house and he says, well, the foundation's done. And then another engineer says, well, I don't know if it's done. So there's a difference of opinion whether the foundation's ready or not. Are you going to build a house on it? So the muhkam verses, there's no discussion. No, why? Is because the language used is so clear. The hadith and other verses come and support it. So the concept is crystal clear. There's absolutely no discussion, no tolerance of any difference of opinion regarding it. And ultimately, the whole point of foundational verses is that they're so clear, you don't need to discuss them. That's the whole point of foundational verses uh, in the Qur'an. So, when someone comes with uh, uh, the claim that, well, it's a difference of opinion, maybe there could be a prophet after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa then we have strayed really so far from any sense of understanding that it's really almost laughable and ridiculous and it should make your blood boil because this is here your beloved deen and religion and the foundations are being chopped away now let me just tell you what's going to happen what's going to happen is that they're going to get academic and they're going to get political and then someone's going to try to convince uh, some major muslim organizations to accept them and just historicize the opinion about them and instead of saying no this is kufr and whoever believes it is can't be a muslim believes that there's a prophet after the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but rather what people are going to do is they're going to say you know what some scholars or a majority of scholars or many scholars okay have deemed that this is disbelief and kufr and so they're going to try to put it like historicize it and we're not saying that but some have said it and, and this type of wishy-washiness regarding the daruriya to deen is something that you should really be careful of and never allow for this type of softness on a major issue. I mean, we're not saying curse the people. The guy, uh, I was talking to a guy, I, I just made the point simply that uh, the, the guy Mirza, their leader, he died a death that, the, the, that Allah is showing us the falsehood of this. He died on the toilet. Not even the toilet, they used to have a house. They used to have a floor here. You go to the bathroom in a little hole. It goes into a bottom hole. Well, he fell into it and died there, right? It's a sign for the people. There's no way Allah will allow a prophet or a wali to die in feces, okay? So he said, oh, you have to have adab. You're not having adab. You're being rude. And this is misplaced adab. Who the, who, what did the prophet do in Musaylim? The liar. Musaylim and kadab. He called him a liar. He called him directly a liar, right? And... Um, this type of approach towards things and don't allow yourself to be sort of um, lured into this uh, false adab. There's adab. We have adab. We have gentleness. We have all the things that we're talking about. 
But in these types of matters, I mean, come on. SubhanAllah. The next thing we're supposed to, the next thing they're going to tell us is you have to have adab with the idols. In any event, onto this subject, which is a beautiful topic, which is what I wanted to do when everything was in a good mood until these Qadianis came after me, right? And they wanted to call us Ahmadis, and I refused to call them Ahmadis and refused to respect their leader. I, I'm sorry I can't do it, right? That just, it's my policy, okay? I cannot respect and try to soften the issue of a man who comes and calls himself a prophet after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then also says that he's the Mahdi Muntadar, and then he also says he's uh, Prophet Isa bin Maryam, like incarnated or some nonsense. Okay, whatever it is, it's all a bunch of nonsense. So you, we, we, if when we're goaded into respecting these things, okay, um, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I can't respect this type of person. I might, I'm not going to insult a Qadiani person, but I'm not going to respect him, nor call him Ahmed, because that's uh, uh, an insult. You can't be insulting someone and then name yourself after him. In any event, our subject today is the domestic life between husband and wife by Imam al-Ghazali, the great Imam, Hujjat al-Islam, he, he holds that the duties of a husband towards his wife are 12. Number one, he has to provide for her a beautiful wedding feast. Number two, he has to provide good companionship, which means that he has to be a companion for her every single day. Right? Every day he needs to be a companionship uh, in with her if he's available, present. Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab said he should not leave his wife for more than four months if he has to for example, if he's part of the army, or for some other reason, four months maximum can be his trip, then he has to come back, then he can go back. The uh, Maliki scholars, I don't know about the Shafi'iyah and the Ahnaf, hold that if a Muslim husband ignores his wife for a day, she has the right to seek a divorce. For one day. Number three, he says dalliance. Dalliance is pampering that he should actually pamper her and, and make her uh, indulge her, and he's going to use the word indulge here, I guess the translation, uh, for his wife, indulge her in what she loves, and make fill her heart with happiness. It's actually a duty. He also must exercise authority around the house to make sure that the kids have manners, that the neighbors aren't bothering the family, that all these things, he has to be that authority, that police figure to make sure the house is stable. It's on him to make sure that the house isn't being invaded, okay, or uh, uh, have, kids are having bad manners or anything like this. He has to have that authority. Number five, he has to have jealousy. And he's going to note here that the jealousy has to be balanced. Neither suffocating jealousy nor no jealousy at all. So he has to have some kind of a jealousy that he shouldn't be happy or he should not feel great when there are other men looking at his wife etc. Chit-chatting, trying to chat it up and do these types of things. All right, He should be having some ghira. Number six, maintenance. He's got to cover all the costs. Number seven, amongst the costs is education. He's responsible that she be educated, um, particularly in the fara'ad of the deen. Number eight, distribution of time. Number nine, which we'll get to. That teaching manners. So if she doesn't know Islamic manners, then he should teach her that. Okay. Number 10, sexual intercourse. That he can't be a hermit. That he owes her at least once every four days. Number 11, children. If she wants children, it's part of the duties of marriage and the purpose of marriage to produce children if she wants children. And then 12, separation through gradual stages and with maruf. Okay, with maruf, the in a, the right way. If he's going to divorce her, then to divorce her uh, in the right way. Okay, so let's get to the first part. The wedding feast is the first good custom to observe. It is re a recommended practice. Sayyidina Anas, it's recommended meaning here, it's a sunnah. It's a highly recommended sunnah. Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once saw a trace of yellow, like a, some yellow powder, on the face of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. He said, what is this? He replies, I have married a woman. Okay, he just got married. The Prophet said, good, now have a wedding. 
So basically, like there was some powder that she had on that came out to him, right? And the Prophet saw it maybe on his beard or something. And he said, uh, what happened? He said, I got married. He said, good. Now the feast, even if it is just with a sheep. In other words, feed people something, even if just with a sheep. On his marriage to Safiya, Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, himself established a wedding feast consisting of dates and sawiq. He said, providing this, the food is a duty on the first day, on the second it is recommended practice sunnah, on the third it is to get oneself talked about. If anyone wants to be heard of, Allah will let everybody know about him on the day of resurrection. So what he's saying here in this hadith is, providing the wedding feast that lasts one day, one day of feast is good. A second day is also good. So you feed people, and it used to be back in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, like a public feast. So you slaughter and you just call to the people and everyone comes. On the second day, it's good. You also get rewarded. On the third day now, you're showing off. It's just to talk, to be talked about. And here is a little implication and a little point here that showing off is oftentimes the goal and oftentimes what is actually happening in weddings. So Prophet peace be upon him warned about showing off and using weddings as a form of showing off. Okay. He said here, Ziyad ibn Abdullah, he used to uh, do this. Uh, Muhaddith from Kufa, he used to have his wedding day over two days, spanning over two days. Okay. It is also recommended that everyone goes and congratulates the husband. Okay. And uh, on entering, one should say to the bridegroom, Allah's blessing for you and upon you, and may He unite you in goodness. Barakallahu lakuma wa baraka alaykuma wa jama'a baynakuma fi khayr. So this is the famous dua of the wedding. When you someone's having a wedding, this is what you say. Barakallahu lakuma wa baraka alaykuma wa jama'a baynakuma fi khayr. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu relates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to always do this. He used to say this dua always. It is further recommended that the marriage be made public. The whole point of marriage is that we know that this is not some kind of um, zina that's going on. This is not something bad that's going on. This is something good. And if it's good, it should be open and public. Okay, Anything secret is always a problem. So usually a problem. So in this case, the sunnah of the walima, the purpose of it is to make it public, to make the wedding public and to make the marriage public public and to let everyone know that when you see these two together, you should not have a doubt. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Beware of mawaqa'at tuham, the places where you can get accused. So don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to be accused, where someone could say, oh, he's walking with a, a woman there, or that woman's walking with so-and-so. So it should be made known in public that a person is, is getting married. He said, publicize the marriage, celebrate it in the mosques, and sound the tambourines to mark it. So use tambourines to let it know, let people know that there's a wedding happening here, there, that these two people got married. And I actually once saw this in the city of Fez. I had no clue what's going on. It was actually startling because you had all these banging tambourines and cans and, and tambourines and all these things. And then I saw, we, we ran out, uh, me and the other students, we ran out and we're like, what is going on here? And it turned out, then there was a white horse with the groom and a white horse with the bride. And they were walking and people were singing and making noise. And they just took a lap around the old city of Fez. And that is actually the way that they used to publicize weddings. So they take a lap and they had dates and they had drinks and they had a man serving uh, rose water and all these, uh, uh, all these types of things so that everyone knows that these two people, when you see them together, now they're married. So that's how they used to do it in the olden days. And they used to take a lap around the city and market and publicize the wedding in that fashion. Al Rubai'i, daughter of Al Mu'awwad, is reported as saying, Allah's Messenger وسلم, called upon me in the morning after my marriage was consummated. Okay, so this man got married, consummated the marriage. He sat on my bed while some servants were beating drums and singing. Okay, some little girls were singing some songs and beating drums. Then one of them said, in our midst, there is a prophet and you're singing and beating drums. Okay. But the prophet Sallallahu said, do not speak like that. Go on. And he told the girls, go on and sing the song that you were singing. So uh, beating the drums and, go, and doing these things is permitted and shouldn't be any shame or embarrassment and any uh, type of uh, 
feeling like, oh my gosh, we're celebrating this is haram, that will be uh, a type of excess. And a ghulu in the deen. I'm not a fan of ghulu in the deen. Yesterday, uh, everyone's watching the, the game. I mean, most people watch the Super Bowl. And there was uh, Omar Suleiman. He did, had this great idea. And apparently it was Sheikh Shinawi's idea to, to put some kind of a halftime show that Muslims could watch instead of music and dancing and nakedness. And I put that up there and someone asked the question, well, don't you always talk about watering down the deen? And isn't this watering down the deen? The answer is no. I'm not against entertainment if it's halal. Why should we be, right? We have Abu Darda, the Sahabi, and even afterwards from the latter scholars, Imam al-Haddad, all of them said that a person should unwind himself every once in a while to re-strengthen himself for ibadah afterwards so that you could go back strongly into ibadat. It's only going to happen uh, if... If you actually can relax yourself in between. Otherwise, you're going to be too stressed out and you overwork yourself. So that's not watering down. What we talked about, when we talk about watering down the deen, has to do with that, what I just talked about earlier. These major red lines and these daruriyat of deen, these critical things like these issues of perennialism, uh, qadianism, uh, reform, deform and regression, okay, that are altering the fundamental landmarks and etching away at the foundations of the religion. Honestly, if it wasn't for those things, these are the major issues. Beyond that, I have no problem with ulama having disagreements. I might have my own opinion, but it's not worth fighting over. It's not worth uh, uh, breaking relationships over. And I would have no problem if all these stuff was taken care of to just sit in the back and let uh, other people uh, uh, handle everything. I have no problem with those issues. But the foundational problem, foundational issues have to... Right. You have to have attention to it. You have to know that there are certain things that will never be, should never be accepted. And the avenue that they're getting into is, well, Trump is coming after Muslims and Trump doesn't distinguish between a, a deformed Muslim and a Sunni Muslim and a Shi'i Muslim and a Qadiani and uh, whoever else. Okay, well, and so we shouldn't, so we should all unify politically. And that's the avenue that they're coming in. And I have to say, I disagree with that. I disagree with that completely. There's no way that we should be um, secularizing our religion and making, you know, I'm Sunni private, making it private, and this is our belief in private, but publicly we should just be uh, recognizing this big tent of Islam. When, when, the scholar, when, when this idea of the big tent involves the four madhabs, right? It doesn't involve these uh, sects, okay? So that's, that's what I think is, uh, should be highlighted as something that should be made a big deal about. But as for having some fun and doing something that's halal, uh, I don't, actually have no problem with that. Number two, good treatment of wives. So he says here, if a woman bothers her husband and annoys her, and by the way, he's going to get to the wife, and if the husband bothers the wife, so don't get upset, then he should have sabr with her, put up with it, and have compassion for her. Okay? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be compassionate with them. Stressing their rights, he says, they have taken from you a solemn covenant. Okay? And the Prophet ﷺ has always reminded, remember what they gave you, which is something very precious, which is okay, their bodies. right? And so therefore, be compassionate with them in return and have sabr with them when they get angry in return. One of the Sahaba, I believe it was Abu Darda, said that uh, whenever my wife uh, gets angry, uh, I, I become patient whenever she gets angry that, or, or whenever I get angry she gets patient Imam Ahmed said the same thing he said there's never been an argument in our house uh, when someone asks him how do, you, how, do, how do two people live together and never argue he says that when she gets angry I say nothing I don't talk and when I get angry she doesn't talk so therefore you need two people to quarrel and there's just no quarrel in the house and he lets it go. And the Prophet ﷺ was one time disobeyed directly. Disobeyed directly by Sayyidah Aisha. He was waking up in the middle of the night. He went out. He told Sayyidah Aisha, stay here and don't leave. Okay? Because he was going to do something in an area where it wouldn't be right for her to go. He went to the graveyard, visited the Sahaba who had passed away in the Battle of Uhud. And on his way back, found that Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha had come out and had actually fallen asleep in the road. Now imagine you come out and you find yourself, he finds his wife 
fall asleep in the road. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, don't come out. But yet she's now in a really vulnerable situation. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, for an instant, he said, didn't I say don't leave the house? In other words, don't follow because it's in the middle of the night. Like you, something bad could have happened to you. And, and Sayyidah Aisha, she said something. She gave an excuse to the Prophet said, I'm just let it go. Right? And the example of the Messenger, peace be upon him, for us is to just let things like that go. Uh, and if someone answers back, also to let it go. Prophet, peace be upon him, we also have the other example where the wives, at one point, some worldliness had entered in. They wanted some, some of the wealth that they saw other women having. And they were raising their voice to the Messenger, peace be upon him. And he was sitting and not saying anything at all until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Umar ibn Khattab and he has the right to come in because Hafsa, his daughter, was in the house. So it's the haq, it's the right of a father to visit his daughter. Even if it's obviously it's another man's house, but it's the right of a father or mother to visit their daughter in their house. So he went into the house and he uh, started scolding Hafsa. How could you be raising your voice at the message of Allah? And then all of the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, mothers of the believers, remained silent. They all became silent suddenly. And then he looked at and he said, all of you are silent because when I come in, but in front of the messenger you raise your voice and yelling at him. And the, one of them spoke out and said, that's because you're hard-hearted and rough. And he is soft-hearted and kind. And then the Prophet, peace be upon him, smiled and he said, uh, she's spoken the truth. Right, so the sunnah to be with uh, one's spouse is that s someone should be forbearing. And as the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave the example that a lion outside the house and a lamb inside the house. This was the example that Sayyidah Aisha told him a story one time. And it's a very long story. And from this, one of our teachers from Sudan, from London, said, This is the hadith that teaches us that any time. At least one session a day, if your wife wants to talk to you, you should never tell her you're busy. You should just listen to everything that she has to say. Okay, and listen and become interested. And if your heart's not interested, make yourself interested. Okay, even if it's a matter of lahu, right? Because this Sayyidah Aisha was telling the Messenger of Allah, he's the Messenger of Allah. He has a religion to establish. He has Sahaba to teach. He's the head of a city. There are people attacking them. There are tribes all around like wolves. And yet she wants to tell him the story of not one woman, not two women, 11 women from pre-Islamic days. It's a tale. It's like a fable, right? 11 women and their situation with their husband. So what does it sound like? It's almost like a, 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 like a, a drama almost, like a fairy to a fable, something that's not real about women and their husbands that the women used to tell. And Aisha had heard it from someone and she started to tell the story to the Prophet. So fiction. It's a story of fiction. It's not something haq. It's not truth. It's not commanding right and forbidding wrong. And yet the Prophet said him sat and listened to the story of 11 women and their husbands. And this hadith is a famous hadith called Hadith Umm Zara. Because the one that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said is the best was, was uh, the husband of Umm Zara. And Umm Zara was the woman who said that my husband is the best. He's outside like a lion and inside like a lamb. However, he divorced her. He divorced Umm Zara. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm like uh, the husband of Umm Zara to you, except that I will not divorce you. All right. So this was the Prophet, peace be upon him, sabr, and a living example, a model, a demonstration on listening, on uh, 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 indulging the story. And if you're not interested, make yourself interested. Like if you hear a verse of Hellfire, right? We, we Muslims, we get very good at making our heart move. If you hear a verse of Hellfire, and it doesn't bother you, then the Prophet said, make it bother you, right? It, you should make it bother you. And likewise, if you don't feel compassion towards another Muslim, towards another person, towards an animal, then make yourself feel compassion. We know that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said a woman who trapped her cat inside the house, she prays all night and she fasts all day. And yet the Prophet, peace be upon him, said uh, uh, she's in the fire because she's being cruel to a cat. So if you find yourself merciless, make yourself merciful. Okay, so in this case, if you're not interested in what they have to say, then make yourself interested as the Prophet made himself interested in the story of Umm Zara. Okay, and the nasiha that I received from Sheikh Abu Bakr Sudani was that at least once a day you should sit and allow your wife to, do to dictate what to talk about and talk about what she wants to talk about. Uh, following this example that the Prophet used to visit whoever his day it was and he used to do this, he didn't dictate the discussion. 
He didn't dictate what's happening and he barely just ate and listened and basically unwind for the rest of the day. Okay, for the end of the day. Okay. The last instruction the Prophet ﷺ gave was about three things. Which he went on speaking till his tongue stammered and his words became, uh, he became tired. Basically he said, the ritual prayer, the ritual prayer. Okay. And he said, your slaves and servants do not impose upon them what they cannot bear. And he said, Allah, Allah, remember him where your women are concerned, for they are like captives in your hands. In other words, in the most cases, the women are stuck, right? In, in most cases in human history, they're stuck with the husband. They may not be happy. So he said, Allah, Allah, in other words, I beseech you by Allah and I warn you and remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember him, okay, when it regards your women, for they are like captives in your hands. All right, awan and in other words, not captives like real slaves, but they're trapped. And most cases, as soon as a woman has one child or two child or three children, and maybe she doesn't have the ability to have an earning power to to to, to 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 provide for them, and maybe she doesn't have a dad and maybe to take care of her, and maybe she doesn't have a brother to take care of her. At that point, she becomes almost trapped, okay, uh, in this marriage. So so be careful of that and be mindful of that and make sure that you don't go to Allah on Yom Al Qiyamah. Where with uh, having died and left a wife that wants to take you as a defendant and she's going to be the plaintiff, okay? Because that's not going to be good. Okay, you have taken them as a trust from Allah and have treated their and and their uh, private area has become lawful for you. So all the privacy of a woman, which is her body, has become lawful for you. So be mindful of this every time that you feel the anger is coming up and you want to talk back, okay? So remember that what is private from the from the woman has become lawful for you. They've allowed this for you, right? So remember this when you become angry. Of course, this is advice for us for, you know, this is tough advice to give because you have to act upon it and practice it. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever endures his wife's bad character, let's say if a woman has bad character, if he endures it, then Allah will re-give, uh, reward him with the reward of Ayyub, Alayhi Salam, for his tribulation, which was his 70 year of sickness. Okay. While to one who endures the bad character of her husband, okay, the bad character of her husband, she will be given the reward like unto the reward of Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. Okay. Asiya mra'ata Fir'aun. All right. And she prayed for a house in paradise to free her from the house that she was in. So she was uh, enduring of the abuse and the evil of Fir'aun and his actions. And she was tormented, seeing that her husband, that she has to live in the same house with him, right, and be her, uh, his wife, is tormenting the people and the prophet that she believes in. All right? And the young boy that she loved, too, which was her adopted son, Sayyidina Musa, alayhi salam, uh, as he was his foster mother. So you can't remember, it, you can't forget that not only was it an issue of Iman and Kufr, but also an issue of a foster mom and her, uh, her foster son her adopted son that she took care of, that she raised. And it was said that the Egyptian women at the time, they would not cohabit with their husbands. So that the royalty of a woman, if a woman was considered royal, like the Imra'at al-Aziz in the time of Yusuf, that such women, that they would not have sexual relations with their husband and they would not have kids with their husband. That was the role of a wife was not for sex and producing children, but rather it was almost like um, a different position. So that she didn't have her own children. That Sayyidah Asya didn't have children. And she had her maternal instinct was coming up and she really wanted a child. And that's where she received Musa alayhi salam. And Allah gave her heart, the Prophet Musa, whom she loved and raised up to manhood. And saw him become a great man. Until at the age of 40, he had to, uh, or at the age of 30, he had to leave. And he had his uh, situation with the Egyptians. And he killed the Egyptian man. And he had discovered that he's actually from uh, the Bani Israel and he started his heart started to turn towards the Bani Israel until he saw a dispute between an Egyptian and a man from Bani Israel and the Egyptian was putting down the Hebrew so Musa punched him or pushed him so hard that he died and then that's basically murder so a Hebrew killed an Egyptian and that's capital punishment so at that point Musa salam fled he crossed the desert went into the Arabian desert into uh, Midian and there, learn the ways of prophecy. He spent 10 years with just the animals, 
herding the sheep and living with a few people in the tribe or in the little family of Abu Madian. And some people say it was the Prophet Shu'aib. Some people say that the person that Prophet Musa spent time with was the other Nabi Shu'aib alayhi salam who had finished his mission with his people and was now living in retirement, worshipping Allah and being with his family alone. And so that Musa alayhi salam lived with him. And what the, the great scholar Abdul Qadr al-Jaylani says is that it shows that when a person is in the midst of worldly affairs and he's busy and his mind is always occupied with worldly affairs that before Musa received the wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he needed 10 years of silence away from the creation so that he could forget all of that he used to be busy with and create a new type of life where his life was very simple, and then he could receive the wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, the, what he's teaching us is that if you want to draw near to Allah, you have to sort of detox first a little bit. And of course, no one's going anywhere for 10 years, right? But rather, for periods of time, and we talked about this in Virtues of Seclusion, is that before we even can start doing our ibadat and draw, start bringing nur into our heart, we have to let the other stuff go. The other stuff has to go. The, the worldly thoughts, the worldly uh, memories that we have in our hearts, the entertainment that's in our minds, the news, all these things, it's got to go, right? And therefore, uh, one of the Syrian scholars, there's a Qasida, and he says, when a person sits down for dhikr, the first third of the dhikr is, uh, the first quarter of the dhikr is just erasing the, the, the short-term memories and the things that have been on our mind. The second quarter of the dhikr is uh, removing the sins. The third quarter of the dhikr is getting engaged with Allah Azza wa Jal. And the fourth quarter, the final portion of the dhikr is where you're no longer even conscious that you're doing dhikr. You're sort of in the mode, right? You're locked in. And he said that's the phases of the dhikr and that's why it takes a while to benefit from the effects of dhikr and that it's much better to do all your dhikr in one shot in one long session than to parse it into many little sessions. Okay, But that's what he said, and that's uh, a little aside on the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. All right, I think that... Okay, we'll, we'll wrap up this section, and then we'll stop it for the day, and anyone has any comments or questions, feel free. You should know that treating them well means more than just keeping them from pain. Treating them well is not just keeping them under a house and having food and then saying, well, what do you have? We have a roof over your head and, and food on the table. He says it means, okay, sabr, putting up with their moods, okay? Putting up with their anger, okay? And having sabr with it. The Prophet's wives used to contradict him. And one of them, one time, talked to him about uh, seeking some certain things all the way from the morning to the night one day that he records here that one day the Prophet said that one of his wives kept talking to him and she had issues and she was upset from morning to night he never left the house just to pray and come back and she kept talking and he was uh, 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 having sabr with that furthermore he relates that one time Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha okay that she had a dispute and she called a judge so here you have the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. he's the judge of all humanity and she's saying, bring us a, bring me a judge. The Prophet said, fine, who are you going to bring? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So she brought Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq says, what is it? She said, judge between us. And Abu Bakr looked at the Prophet and said, how can I judge the Prophet of Allah? And the Prophet said, he nodded his head. And then, she, and then the Prophet said, who should speak first? To say to Aisha. She said, you speak first, but don't speak except the truth. At that, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he like, put, got so angry, he pulled out a stick. Okay? And, uh, and Sayyidina Aisha ran behind the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that was the end of the dispute. So, uh, so when, even when Sayyidina Aisha wanted to uh, bring a judge on the Prophet, he accepted it. So a lot of sabr and a lot of forbearance. And I'm telling you, if a person has some roughness in his heart, what he should do is study this chapter. If he gets married, then that roughness in his heart will go away. The sabr will come and you'll be make sacrifices that are necessary sometimes. And it's good for your soul to have this kind of sabr uh, with, with people. So the best practice is to practice right in your own home. 
right? And that's why I honestly don't understand how people can give, be giving advice, right, uh, when they're not when they're uh, when they're not married. I'm talking specifically about priests, right? How are they going to lead people when they don't know how they're living day in and day out? Okay. With no disrespect to the Catholic religion, but it's just I'm just wondering how is it that he knows what's going on in your house? Okay, what kind of ups and down of moods people have? Okay. So another one, the Venerable Omar ibn Khattab was contradicted. His wife contradicted him, said no, Omar ibn Khattab. He said something. His wife said no, and he says, "Are you going to contradict me?" And she said, the wives of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have contradicted him with more, and he's better than you. Right? And he's the Prophet, peace be upon him. Alright? And he became so upset. He said, Hafsa better not contradict the Messenger of Allah. Okay? And then he said to Hafsa, and he went to Hafsa. Okay? And he went to him. And he said, I heard that you all contradict the Prophet, peace be upon him, and talk back to him. He said, you better not uh, talk back to him. And he said, don't think that you're like Aisha, okay? Because Aisha is the darling of the Messenger of Allah, and he will tolerate anything from her, right? So this was Sayyidina Umar wanting his family to be upright and polite, and, and as any Muslim child should be, any Muslim should be, period, with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay? And you could link this back up to what we said earlier about those doctrines which insult the Prophet, peace be upon him, by... Uh, even either making his belief in him not obligatory for a Muslim, or uh, believing that, that his finality is not final, his prophethood is not final. Okay, so uh, every Muslim household, the Prophet peace be upon him said, raise them on the recitation of the Quran, the love of the Prophet, and the love of his family. And uh, Usama Kanan, may Allah subhanahu wa taala give him shifa and give him sabr and give his whole family sabr, who's now sick with ALS. He said something one time that really just hit me. And Ibadur Rahman is, is joining us here. And he was there. Ibad, I think, was there. It was at NYU some while back. Khalid Latif had put together an event. And Osama said, To the degree that Muslims understand, love, and respect the Prophet, peace be upon him, then they love, respect, and understand Islam. Uh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Because you can know the Quran inside out, but not have any touch of the Messenger, peace be upon him. But a person could know everything about the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he'll know Islam perfectly, even if he's jahil on the matters of the Qur'an. Which, of course, does not decrease the rank of the Qur'an, of course, but uh, Islam is from the Prophet, peace be upon him, and there is no group of people more who emphasizes more than Qadi Iyad and the scholars of the Maliki Madhab and uh, his book, Ash-Shifa in Hukuk al-Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is basically the summary of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, all revolves around giving the Prophet his rights because if you do, then your aqidah will be sound, your fiqh will be sound, everything will be sound, and your heart will be sound, your adab will be sound, and the community will be sound, etc. Okay. The Prophet is the living example of the Quran. So, knowing the Prophet is like having the tafsir of the Quran. Okay. Whereas having the Quran alone does not necessitate you understand the Quran. So, you, if you don't understand the Prophet, peace be upon him, all right. If you, under, sorry, if you do understand the Prophet, peace be upon him, you have understood the Qur'an, but vice versa is, not, is possible. You could possibly have the Qur'an, study it all your life, and if you don't study the Prophet, peace be upon him, then you could easily misunderstand the Qur'an and can be led misguided by it. Okay. It is related that one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ okay, was one time uh, pointing to the Prophet and pointing him on his chest. Okay. And the mother of that, uh, of, that, of that woman, of that wife, was there and she knocked her hand down and said, don't do that to the Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet said, leave them be. They do sometimes do worse than that. Okay. So the, just to show you, if the Messenger is having this sabr, right, then who are we to be walking like Fir'aun in the house? Sometimes you think, really, sometimes you don't want your wife to read these chapters. You're going to be in trouble. So you're going to start quoting stuff. An altercation once broke out between the Prophet and Sayyidah Aisha and they brought Abu Bakr as referee. We just talked about that. Another time, she said to him, You call yourself Allah's Prophet indeed. SubhanAllah. And Allah's Messenger smiled and laughed. Okay. 
The Prophet often times said to her, I can tell when you're angry and when you're happy. When you're angry, you swear by every prophet except me. Right? Uh, you swear by the God of every prophet but me. And when you're happy, then you swear by me. Uh, the God, my, uh, by, by the Lord of Muhammad. It is said that the first love in Islam was that of the Prophet and Sayyidah Aisha. He used to say to her, I am unto you like Abu, Zara, Abu Zara to Umm Zara, except that I shall never divorce you. And he used to say to his other wives, do not torment me about Aisha. By Allah, the revelation came down to me while I was in her bed. Well, I was in nobody else's bed but hers. Okay? And it's also the wahi is what married the Prophet to Aisha. He didn't think of it himself, but rather the wahi came with the marriage of Aisha. The Prophet ﷺ saw a dream in which Sayyidina Jibreel brought him a silk garment. And, uh, and then when he opened it, he found Aisha. Anas said, Allah's blessed messenger was the most compassionate of men towards women and towards children. So here you have it. And the sunnah overrides and abrogates completely anyone who imagines that he can hit his wife. And we said earlier, and we talked about this before, that any time that striking the wife comes is not striking them like batting them around, but rather physically removing them from what harms them and what harms their family. Okay, such as a woman doing zina. If you, a man comes in and finds his wife doing zina, then he can physically remove her. Okay, from that area. If a woman is on drugs or she drinks, he can physically restrain her from drinks and drugs. Okay, if and, and those types of situations, that is the tafsir and the correct understanding of the ayah which they call 434. All right, Okay, uh, in which some people imagine that this is a man going around smacking his wife around whenever he's not happy with her, that this is good, that this is okay. Such a person, I'm telling you, you have to study the Prophet, peace be upon him. Don't try to do a tafsir okay, of yourself because we were taught by Sheikh Sadiq, he says, Al Quran, all right, tafsiruhu madalla, the Quran, trying to understand it with yourself, right, is a madalla, mataha. You're going to get lost, you can even go astray. Not only can you get lost, you can go astray, right? So what you have to do is, under, is understand the seerah and the shama'il and the sifats of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Then we'll truly understand Islam. All right, so let's uh, stop here and uh, take any of your questions or comments. Let's see what we have here. Do we have any in-depth book on Sayyidah Isha? If anyone has any such book, please uh, mention it because I myself personally don't know of any in-depth book, biography on a Sayyidah Isha radiallahu anha. Jibreel ibn Ahmad says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What's the second part of the kalima for, if not to distinguish the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and al-yawm akmaltu lakum deenakum. He's right, and this issue is a daruri issue, and what we're talking about is the qadiyaniya, and I mentioned the qadiyaniya earlier in the stream because uh, I said that I'm telling you what's, what's, on, what's coming forward as a, as a forecast, all right, uh, as a forecast, and Allah only knows what's going to happen, but as a forecast, this group, the Qadianis, they're going to try to get academic, they're going to try to get political, and they're going to try to weasel their way into mainstream Muslim organizations. And what they're going to try to do is make it such that you can't basically say that this ideology is kufr and whoever follows it is kufr and the Qadianis are not Muslim, that they're going to try to go that route. And what I'm saying is, personally speaking, I... Uh, don't have any plans to really respect uh, uh, or to mince words on the doctrine of the Qadianis, right? And uh, that it's direct kufr and there's no wiggling around it and there's no, no nubu after the Prophet wasallam. Whatever they want to uh, wiggle in and say dreams came and the Prophet said 146 the prophecy remains in you. That doesn't mean someone can be called a Nabi, right? It has nothing to do with that, right? And that the Prophet wasallam said muhaddathun Right, that those who are inspired and all these ty types of things that they try to wiggle, uh, I'm totally not interested. Um, totally not interested with uh, into mincing words on that subject. I'm not insulting any of them, but I'm saying that I don't really have any respect for uh, Mirza Ghulam, the liar, uh, and nor do I have Fritz Schwan or any of these other uh, uh, liars who are basically trying to invent. They're basically inventing new religions. Suhail so, Badat says, Islam, is this a regular series? When do you plan to continue? I do plan to do a stream every Monday. And the series on marriage, some of them are live streamed and some of them you're going to have to get them from Teachables, uh, which is safina-online.teachable.com when it goes up. And so there are a lot of videos on the marriage topic that are not streamed, 
But we do. I, I'm trying to do a stream every Monday. Maria says, I don't understand the part about revelation coming when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was with Aisha. What he meant was the Prophet, peace be upon him, was uh, when he when he was laying down in bed, he would never receive revelation, with exception to when he was lying down next to Aisha in the bed. He received revelation while laying down in bed next to Sayyidah Aisha, and this never happened to any other, other wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Raida Wilson says, what do you recommend as a primer on the seerah? Um, there are a couple. Karen Armstrong, number one, even though she's not a Muslim, I wish she was a Muslim, she's, got, she's, she's done so much in support of Islam and in support of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And uh, she's done so much, I just wish that Allah, will, I, I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal guide her. She has a great book on the seerah. Uh, Tariq Ramadan, uh, whom the accusations against him to me are nonsense. Uh, I, 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 I know the man, not closely, but I know him. And I don't believe anything that's being said until they prove it. Right? A man is innocent until proven guilty. But he has a good book on the seerah. And my favorite is Martin Ling's book on the seerah, with the exception of the one line that he has in which he puts in his perennialist uh, idea, which is basically that these two streams, Islam and Christianity, came together as if they're both true. Uh, and we know that uh, Christianity is mensukh, abrogated, and we know that they have also uh, um, altered their book, so their book is not reliable to, to follow in the first place. None of their sources are reliable to be followed in the first place. But he does insert that idea, and he has like a couple other minor errors, and you could look at uh, Jibril Haddad, GF Haddad, he puts uh, his critique of Martin Lynch's book, but personally speaking, that Tut goes straight to my heart. The style of his writing, uh, everything about it, goes straight into my heart. Martin Ling's uh, his book on the Sirah. It's called uh, Muhammad, His Life Based on the Earliest Sources, which is basically a translation of Ibn Hisham. Okay? Ibn Ishaq, and Ibn, Ibn Ishaq, which is a summary of Ibn Hisham. Oh, sorry, Ibn Hisham is a summary of Ibn Ishaq. It's Ibn Ishaq lived in the time of Imam Malik. Ibn Hisham is his student who basically took his Sirah, polished it off, Okay, and that's the main sira. That's one of the best ones we have. And Martin Ling's book is is more or less a translation of that. And he has other things. Uh, he he also takes from Ibn Sa'd as well. All right, Anas Ahmed says, "Salam." Which works of tafsir in English language would you recommend? The best work of tafsir in the English language is that of the. I always forget the name of it. It's the work of Mufti Muhammad Shafi, who is the current Mufti of Pakistan, his father. And I always forget uh, the, the actual name of the book. It's like eight volumes. I don't even know how you're going to buy it. Maybe it's a PDF. Okay, but that's... Uh, I don't even know that many tafsirs in the English language. As for translations, I, my, 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 what my recommendation on that is Muhammad Halim's, Muhammad Abdul Halim's Oxford uh, publication of the translation of the Qur'an. Except as well on the word Islam, he also translates it as submission. I guess he had to be politically correct. Uh, Verily, the religion in the sight of Allah is Islam, or um, the only religion acceptable uh, is Islam. And he translates that as submission, which is a political translation. I guess he had to do that, but he knows it's not right. Junaid Saleh Hayat says, Jazakallah for the uh, provoking podcast. Please do more. Yeah, well, inshallah, we'll, do, we'll try to do one every Monday, bidnillah. Uh, Fauzia says, what is meant by marrying fulfills half of the deen? Specifically, what is gained in the deen? Your character and your good deeds. Your character, good deeds, and understanding of the divine attributes. Because your character when you have to have sabr. Your character when you have to be giving. Your character when you have to defend. Your even understanding of Islam changes when you're married and you have little rugrats running around and you have dependents and you live in a community. Your understanding of the deen becomes more sharp, more clear, and you push away the stuff that's more just extracurricular or unnecessary. Okay, And your good deeds increase because every day you go out to work and you bring back uh, food and you bring back a house, right? or you put a, a roof over these uh, little kids' head and you, you take care of your spouse, etc. All these are good deeds that could not possibly happen outside of marriage or, and outside of having a family. And likewise, your understanding of the divine attributes grows and increases from the aspect that uh, to understand the nature of sabr, to understand the nature of generosity, to understand the nature of hilm, to understand the nature of people and the, how they change, to understand uh, the nature of uh, a lot of different 
attributes of Allah, uh, uh, attributes of character, which makes you understand the, those divine attributes, which you wouldn't understand otherwise. Okay, so only by existing with people and in close quarters can you truly uh, understand these attributes. And when you understand attributes, and then you realize that Allah describes Himself with those attributes, then your understanding of Allah Himself increases and becomes more amplified. Nahid Faruqi says, Salam Shaykh, on the subject of striking the wife, please could you explain how do we justify the incident of the Prophet Ayyub, peace be upon him, striking his wife, albeit lightly? Thanks. Well, he had sworn it, right? And so he, instead of fasting three days, then Allah said, take a uh, hundred pieces of wheat and tap her with it. So just to, 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 uh, to uh, fulfill his oath, because in a moment of rage, he, beca- he said to her, uh, in a moment of anger, I should say, he said to her, Wallahi, I'm going to give you a hundred lashes. And the phrase a hundred lashes is like, was like a phrase, right? But he, uh, he needed to fulfill it. It's not like he wanted to do that, right? But he came stuck. He didn't want to do it. He became stuck. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him an outlet for it, which was take a hundred uh, things of wheat and tap her with it. And that's it. So he, he said it as an idiom, right? And we say this all the time, right? Uh, go do, you know, uh, you, you scold your kids. You said, oh, Wallahi, I'm going to hit you. If you don't do this, right? And for us, in our sharia, if you say an oath like that, it doesn't count. It's called uh, lahu al-hadith, right? And it's an oath that doesn't count uh, by mercy in our sharia. But for the Prophet Ayyub, he, he said it, and now he had to actually fulfill it. So uh, instead of having to fast three days and having broken his oath, because he's a prophet, he can't break his oath. So then Allah gave him an outlet. Right, and it was uh, harmless, basically, just a tap. Okay, I hope that answers the question. All right, if there are no other questions, we'll just give it a second, and if there are no other questions, we'll log off. Inshallah. Alrighty, Jazakum Allah khairan, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk wal asr inna al-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr wa salamu alaykum wa